A Simple Heart by Gustave Flaubert For half a century, the housewives of pont le eveque envied Madame Aubon because of her servant, Felicité. For a hundred francs a year, she did the cooking and the cleaning, sewed, washed, ironed, knew how to bridle a horse, fatten poultry, churn butter, and she remained loyal to her mistress, who wasn't easy to get along with. She had married a handsome young man with no fortune, who died at the beginning of 1809, leaving her with two small children and many debts. So she sold her properties, except for two farms, one at Touquets and the other at Gefossez. Since their rents brought her no more than 500 francs, she left her house in St. Milan for one less costly to maintain. It was behind the market square and had belonged to her family for generations. This house, with its slate roof, stood between an alley and a lane that led to the river. The floor levels inside were uneven and could make you stumble. A narrow hall separated the kitchen from the parlor where, by the casement window, Madame Aubon would sit all day long in a wicker armchair. Eight mahogany chairs were lined up against the white plaster walls. Boxes and cartons were heaped on top of an old piano. A barometer hung on the wall above them. Two small upholstered chairs flanked a Louise fifteenth fireplace of yellow marble. In the middle stood a cloak shaped like a temple of Vesta, and everything smelled a little musty because the floor was lower than the garden. On the floor above was, first of all, Madame's bedroom. It was large and its walls were papered over in a pattern of pale flowers. Here hung a portrait of Monsieur dressed up like a dandy. The adjoining room was smaller and contained two bare trundle beds. Next came the drawing room, always kept shut and filled with furniture covered in dust sheets. A hallway led to the study. A large desk of dark wood was surrounded by shelves crammed with books and papers. The remaining wall space was covered by pen and ink sketches, gouache landscapes, and all-drawn engravings, souvenirs of happier days and managed luxury. On the top floor was Felicity's room. Its dormer window looked out over the fields. She would rise at dawn so as not to miss mass, and she would work without rest until nightfall. Then, once dinner was over, the dishes washed and put away, the door locked, she would spread the ashes over the fire and fall asleep in front of the hearth her rosary in her hand. No one, at market, could beat her at getting a bargain. As for neatness, the gleam of her pots and pans made other servants despair. She was frugal and would eat slowly, picking up the crumbs from the table. Her loaf of bread, baked especially for her, weighed twelve pounds and would last her three weeks. Rain or shine, she would drape a printed cotton scarf over her shoulders fastened at the back with the pin. A bonnet hid her hair. Her stockings were gray, her petticoat red. The apron she wore over her rough jacket resembled those used by hospital nurses. Her face was thin, her voice sharp. At twenty-five she looked forty. Once past fifty she seemed ageless, always silent, her back straight, her movements precise. She resembled a woman of wood functioning like clockwork. Like anyone, she had once known love. Her father, a bricklayer, had been killed in a fall from a ladder. Then her mother died. Her sisters went their ways, and a farmer took her in. Young as she was, he used her to watch over the cows in the fields. She shivered in her rags. Lying on her stomach, she would drink marsh water. She was beaten for no reason, and finally was accused of having stolen thirty sous, something she hadn't done. She went to another farm, where she worked in the yard. She pleased the owners, and the other servants grew jealous. One August evening, she was now eighteen, they took her to a country dance at Colesville. Right away she was overwhelmed, stunned by the scraping fiddles, the lights in the trees, the hodgepodge of dresses, laces, gold crucifixes, the seething mass of dancers. She was standing quietly to one side when a well-dressed young man, smoking a pipe and resting his arms on the shaft of a cart, asked her to dance. 
He brought her cider, coffee, sweet cakes, a silk scarf. Thinking she understood what he was after, he offered to walk her home. When they came to a field of oats, he roughly threw her to the ground. She was frightened and began to scream. He took off. Another evening on the road to Beaumont, she wanted to get by a large hay wagon that was plodding along. Brushing past its wheels, she recognized Theodore. He greeted her matter-of-factly, saying that he should be totally forgiven, since the booze was to blame. She didn't know how to answer him. She wanted to run away. He began talking about the harvest and people of local importance. Now that his father had left Colesville for the Ecot's farm, they were practically neighbors. Oh, she said. He added that they wanted him to settle down, but he wasn't in any hurry. He'd wait until he found a woman he liked. She bowed her head. Then he asked her if she was thinking about getting married. She replied, smiling, that it was cruel of him to make fun of her. But I swear to you, I'm not. And he put his left arm around her. They walked on together slowly. A soft breeze blew. The stars shone. The immense hay wagon swayed in front of them. And the four horses, dragging their hooves, kicked up the dust. Without needing a command, the horses turned to the right. He kissed her once more. She fled into the dark. The next week, Theodore persuaded her into several rendezvous. They would meet on the edge of a farm, behind a wall, under a solitary tree. She wasn't innocent in the sense the young ladies are, living with animals had shown her how it was done, but reason and self-respect kept her from giving in. This resistance exasperated Theodore, either to get his way, or perhaps, out of naivete, he proposed to her. She found it difficult to believe him. He swore that he was sincere. Soon he confessed that he had a problem. Last year his parents had paid a stand-in to perform his military service, but now he was again at risk. He might be called at any moment. The thought of being drafted terrified him. Felicité took this cowardice as proof of his love, and her own redoubled. She would steal away at night to be with him. As soon as they were together, Theodore would torment her with his pleas and his fears. Finally, he announced that he would go in person to the authorities and find out how things stood. He would tell her the outcome next Sunday, between 11 and midnight. When the time came, she ran to meet her love. Instead, she found one of his friends. He told her she must never see Theodore again. To avoid the draft, he had married a rich old woman, Madame Le Jose, from Touquet. It was a staggering blow. She threw herself on the ground screamed, called on Almighty God, and sobbed alone in the fields until sunrise. Then she went back to the farm, gave her notice, and at the end of the month, having collected her wages, she wrapped up her few belongings in a handkerchief and made her way to pont de l'Eveque. Outside the inn, she asked directions from a housewife who was wearing a widow's cap. As chance would have it, she was in need of a cook. The girl lacked experience, but she seemed so amenable and eager to serve that in the end Madame Alban said, All right, I'll take you. A quarter of an hour later, Felicité was in her house. At first, she lived there almost in fear because of the spirit of the place and the memory of Monsieur, which brooded over everything. Paul, who was seven, and Virginet, barely four, seemed to her to be made of some precious substance. She played piggyback with them, and Madame Aubon told her not to be kissing them every other minute. The scolding hurt, but all in all, she was happy. The pleasant nature of her surroundings had assuaged her grief. On Thursdays, the usual group of regulars would gather for a game of Boston. Felicité would set out the cards and foot warmers ahead of time. The guests would arrive at the stroke of eight and leave before eleven. Each Monday morning, the second-hand dealer down the alley would haul out his wares onto the pavement. Then the town would fill with the hubbub of voices, mixed with the neighing of horses, the bleeding of lambs, the grunting of pigs, and the clatter of carts in the street. 
Around noon, when the market was in full swing, a tall old farmer would show up at the door. He had hooked nose and wore his cap backwards. This was Robelin, the tenant at Guilfosse. Soon afterwards, Lebad would appear. He rented the farm at Touquet. He was short, plump, with a red face, a grey jacket, and spurs on his boots. These two would be offering cheeses or hens to Madame. Felicité invariably saw through their schemes, and they would go away with renewed respect for her. From time to time, one of Madame Aubon's uncles, the Marquis of Gremlinville, would pay a visit. Ruined by drink, he lived in Falaise on his last scrap of property. He always showed up at lunchtime with the hideous poodle that puts its dirty paws all over the furniture. Despite his efforts at playing the gentleman, he would doff his hat whenever he said, My departed father, his habits would get the better of him. He would down glass after glass and tell off color stories. Felicité would politely push him outside. You had enough, Monsieur de Gremonville. Until next time. And then she would shut the door. She would open it gladly for Monsieur Bourret, a retired lawyer. His white tie and bald pate, his frilled shirt, his ample brown coat, the way he had of cocking his elbow while taking a pinch of snuff, everything about him produced the inner stirring we feel when in the presence of remarkable men. As the manager of Madame's estate, he would spend hours shut up with her in Monsieur's study. He observed the letter of the law, he had a deep respect for the bench, and he considered himself a scholar of Latin. To educate and amuse the children, he brought them an illustrated geography book. The pictures were of scenes from all over the world. Cannibals wearing feathered headdresses, an ape carrying away a maiden, Bedouins in the desert, a whale being harpooned, and the like. Paul explained the engravings to Felicité. This would be the extent of her formal education. The children received theirs from Guyot, a poor wrench who worked in the town hall. He was well known for his beautiful penmanship and his habit of sharpening his knife on his boots. When the weather was good, they would set out early for the farm at Gefosse. The farm was on a slope, with the house in the middle and the grey smudge of sea in the distance. Felicité would take out slices of cold meat from her basket, and they would eat lunch in a room beside the dairy, all that was left of an old summer home. The wallpaper, curling in strips, fluttered in the eddying air. Madame would sit, her head bowed, lost in her memories. The children didn't dare say a word. Go out and play, she would say to them, and off they'd go. Paul would climb around in the barn, catch birds, skip stones on the pond, or bang on big barrels with a stick. They sounded like drums. Virginet would feed the rabbits or hurry off to pick bluebells. She would run so fast her little embroidered pantaloons would show under her dress. One autumn evening, they were returning home through the fields. The new moon lit up one part of the sky. A mist floated like a scarf over the winding river. Cattle lay resting in the meadows, looking calmly at the four of them as they walked by. In the third pasture, several rose up and started to circle them. Don't be afraid, said Felicité, and humming a sad ballad of a song, stroked the nearest one on its back. It turned away, and the others followed after. The next field was crossed safely. And then there was a loud bellow. It was a bull. The mist had hit him. He made for the two women. Madame Aubin started to run. No, no, not so fast, said Felicité. All the same, they hurried on, hearing the snuffling growing louder behind them. His hooves were pounding the grass like hammers. He was coming on fast. Felicité turned, and... Picking up clods of dirt, she flung them at his eyes. He lowered his head, tossed his horns, and, shaking with rage, bellowed horribly. Madame Aubon, 
having reached the end of the pasture with her two children, searched in vain for the bull. Felicite kept throwing dirt and grass to blind him, and shouting, Hurry! Hurry! Madame Alban scrambled into the ditch, pushing Virginet and Paul in front of her. She fell several times as she tried to climb the bank, but she persevered and made it. The bull had cornered Felicite, trapping her against the closed gate. His foam splattered her face. In a moment, he'd gore her. At the last second, she slipped between the slats, and the huge beast, taken by surprise, came to a stop. For years, this adventure was talked about in pont de l'Eveque. Felicite wasn't proud of herself. She wasn't even sure if she had done anything heroic. Her thoughts were focused on Virginie. The fright had affected the girl's nerves. Dr. Poupa recommended the sea baths at Trouvelle. They weren't so fashionable these days. Madame Aubon made inquiries, consulted Bouret, and acted as if she was preparing for a long voyage. The luggage went first, in Le Bad's cart. The next morning he showed up with two horses. One had a cloak folded over its cropper to serve as an extra saddle. This was for Madame. She would ride with Libert. The other horse, fitted with a lady saddle with a velvet backrest, was for Virginet. Felicite would accompany her on foot. For Paul, there was Monsieur Le Chapotois's donkey, lent on the condition that they take good care of it. The road was so bad it took them two hours to go five miles. The horses sank up to their posterns in the mud, their muscles quivering as they struggled to free themselves. Sometimes they stumbled in the ruts. At other times they had to leap over them. Often Libad's mare would refuse to budge. While he patiently waited for her to get going, he would talk about the people who lived along the route, any comments of a moral nature. So it was that in 2K, as they were passing beneath some windows wreathed in nasturtiums, he said with a shrug of his shoulders, That's where Madame La Jose lives. Instead of taking a young man, Felicite didn't hear the rest. The horses trotted along, the donkey galloped. They made their way in single file down a side path. A door opened. Two boys appeared. They dismounted next to a dunghill that stood by the front door. Lebad's wife seemed delighted to see her mistress. She served her a lunch of sirloin, tripes, black pudding, chicken fricassee, sparkling cider, fruit pie, and brandied plums. And she doled out compliments to Madame on her improved health, to Virginie, who had become magnificent, and to Monsieur Paul, so big and strong. She didn't mention the children's grandparents, now defunct. The Lebas had known them, having been in the family service for many years. The farm, like themselves, wore the air of antiquity. The roof beams were warm eaten the walls were black with soot, the windows gray with dust. An oak sideboard stood by covered with utensils of every sort, with jugs, dishes, pewter bowls, wolf traps, sheep shears, and an enormous syringe that made the children laugh. Every tree in the three courtyards had mushrooms growing at its base, or sprigs of mistletoe in its branches. Several had been uprooted by the wind. They were sending out new shoots, and every branch bent under the weight of its apples. The thatch roofs had the look of brown velvet, thick in some places, thin in others. They had weathered the roughest storms, but the wagon shed was falling apart. Madame said that she would have it repaired, and ordered the animals to be saddled. It took another half hour to reach Treville. The little caravan went on foot past the Ecros, a cliff jutting out over some boats. Three minutes later, at the end of the pier, they entered the courtyard of Dagno Dois, run by Madame David. From her first days there, Virginie seemed stronger, due to the change of climate and to the baths. She would take them in her nightdress, not having a bathing costume. Her nurse would dress her in the custom shed used by the bathers. In the afternoons, they would lead the donkey past Rocher Noir, in the direction of Hennecasville. 
At first, the path went upright among grassy swales, like those in a park, until it reached a plateau of pastures and plowed fields. Blair thickets and holy brushes grew beside the path. Here and there stood a tall dead tree, its branches making zigzags in the blue sky. Almost always they would rest in the meadow with Deauville on their left, La Havre on their right, and before them the open sea. It glittered in the sunlight, smooth as a mirror, so quiet one could scarcely hear its murmuring. Hidden sparrows chirped, and above everything hung the immense vault of heaven. Madame Bond sat sewing. Beside her, Virginie plaited rushes. Felicité gathered lavender. Paul, bored, wanted to be off. On other days, having crossed the Touquet's river by boat, they would collect seashells. Low tide revealed sea urchins, starfish, jellyfish. The children ran about chasing flecks of foam borne by the wind. The lazy surf tumbled onto the sands that stretched as far as the eye could see, while landward the beach ended in dunes bordering the marais, a large meadow shaped like a horse track. When they took that way back, Trouville, at the bottom of the hill, grew larger with every step and its jumble of houses seemed to spread out in joyful confusion. When it was too hot, they stayed indoors. Bright day painted bars of dazzling light between the window blinds. Not a sound in the village. No one in the streets below. All things rested, steeped in silence. From afar came the tapping of cockers' hammers against the boat holes. The warm breeze smelled of tar. The main event of the day was the return of the fishing boats. Once past the buoys, they would start to tack. As their mainsails were lowered, their foresails would swell like balloons, and they would come on, cutting across the rough water until they reached mid-harbor. There, suddenly, they would drop anchor. As a boat tied up at the pier, the crew stood waiting, and women wearing cotton bonnets rushed forward to grab the baskets and embrace their men. One day, one of these women approached Felicite, who returned to the room a short while later, overjoyed. She had found a long-lost sister, and Nastasie Barret, now Larue, appeared, nursing a baby at her breast. Another child was on her right, while on her left a little cabin boy stood with his arms akimbo and a barrette tilted over one ear. After a quarter of an hour, Madame Alban sent them away. They would meet them again, either hanging around at the kitchen or when they went out for a walk. The husband never appeared. Felicite grew fond of them. She brought them a blanket, shirts, a stove. Obviously, they were using her. This annoyed Madame Aubon, who also didn't care for the nephew's manners, but he addressed her son as an equal. Since Virginie was coughing and the weather was getting worse, they returned to Pont l'Eveque. Monsieur Bourra helped choosing a boarding school for Paul. The one I kind was said to be the best, so Paul was enrolled there. He said his goodbyes cheerfully, glad to be going to a place where he could have friends of his own. Madame Aubin resigned herself to her son's going away. It had to be. Virginie soon ceased to think of him. Felicite missed his ruckus, but a new responsibility would distract her. From Christmas onward, she would accompany Virginie to daily catechism. 